We are now up to chapter seven of the book In the One Spirit, which is about my great grandmother, Harry Burnett Rhodes. This book was written by the same person who brought early attention to the now famous psychic and healer, Edgar Casey. Check out the other videos for the amazing stories of healing, including hard to believe miracles like helping children born blind to see. Pulling this off once, you can see how you can rationalize this, but she did this for at least 14 different children over her lifetime. This chapter is the one where she explains what she knows of how this power works. We have heard bits and pieces of these explanations in the previous videos. I know this was her truth, and I know from my parents and relatives that she was a lovely, gentle, authentic woman who just liked helping people. Every day she did her best to live the principles that she tells here, and also to reap the rewards. I am exploring this material with an open mind. This is a different way of looking at things from how we are usually taught should be the path to a happy, successful life. I also know that what she says is in harmony with many teachers and mystics from throughout all of history, even up to today. Harry Vernette Rhodes was an extremely gifted healer. What she writes is not as out there as it may seem, unless you are not familiar with mindfulness or meditation, Reiki healing, or things like synchronicities. There is solid proof that these sorts of things benefit people, and it is worth understanding why some of these things might help. What if this were the story of your great-grandmother? Chapter 7, How the Power Works. Average people, meaning nearly everybody, at some time react very strangely to psychic phenomenon, largely because their experience outruns their explanations. Maybe they have a dream that catches their interest with its unmistakable elements of foretelling, or they have a premonition, which was too accurate for chance. They write a letter to an absent friend from whom they have not heard for a very long time, only to find that a letter from that very friend was on its way to them. Or maybe they have an amusing experience when they are persuaded to let someone cast their horoscope or tell their fortune with cards. And the facts that are given by the stranger are too intimate to have been accidental. And the prophecy turns out to be disconcertingly accurate. Or perhaps at a more intellectual level, they go visit Duke University or City College of New York or Harvard to watch the controlled experiments with dice and spotted card experiments, looking to verify whether or not our minds are capable of influencing plants, things, or even other people. When the observers leave, they almost wish they had not come. Who wants his worldview and even his sense of values needled by questions and pierced by doubt? So what do people do about these unusual experiences? Mostly they shrug them off. They assure themselves there's nothing to it, of course, but still, what if, obviously something was not on the level, I know, but still. If these experiencers mention it at all, they do so with a half apologetic laugh to make sure that everyone else knows they do not believe in magic. To be sure, if the uncanny incidents happen again, they are harder to ignore, but most people try not to think too much about it. They do not like that half feeling that they might be getting weird or worse, that they might sound weird. Now it is true that many psychic experiences do not make sense in the light of our accepted theories. And whenever an experience does not fit into a neat category already set up, then the tendency is to discount the experience. Who wants a well-packed traveling bag with a few odds and ends of apparel trailing out? Better to just discard the apparel. When experience will not fit into the case prepared for it, just lop it off. But many of us to whom psychic phenomena are a daily occurrence feel an urge to keep searching for explanations, as well as refining and defining our experience. I now realize that when certain conditions are fulfilled, it is easier for the healing power to come through me and also for individuals from the unobstructed universe to make themselves apparent to me. Although I am not sure what all these conditions are, 
However, one fact is that when I feel anxiety or anger, this appears to create a barrier against clear reception. I also know that need often brings a messenger with help. This is true whether it is my need or the need of someone else, but probably there are other roles still to be discovered. Even things like atmospheric conditions may be relevant. I want to mention that the government's classified remote viewing project that took place in the late 20th century identified more conditions in published papers that could be added to her list. So back to the book. One thing I do not know is why I see an individual dressed in clothes similar to those that he wore during his Earth life. Some explanations say that the dead are clothed in thought forms, which have the appearance of clothes. Perhaps these clothes are made of the same material as their bodies. To us on Earth, this appears less solid because it has a higher vibration. Another explanation could be that my mind picks up on the personality from the Akashic record. That is how the person looks and what they wore. The Akashic record is an invisible and indelible record saved in time space, which contains an imprint of all the actions, words, and thoughts that mortals have. Some psychics do have the gift of making contact with the Akashic record and reading back the life stories of long ago or bringing back valuable historical and medical information. Some of the knowledge which comes to me relative to a specific disease sometimes comes from this Akashic time-space record, but that is not always the source. At various times, explanations regarding the healing power have come through to me, and I've written them down. In the winter of 1937, a series of lessons were given to me, which were published under the title, The Power of Healing from the Tree of Life. The gist of these lessons follows. The universe vibrates. Everything in the universe has its own particular rate of vibration. The universal substance which fills the universe is called the universal ether, universal energy, cosmic force, electromagnetic power, and many other names. The human body is created of this universal energy vibrating at the rate which vibrates or manifests as matter as we know it. In good health, the body vibrates rapidly and is full of power. In sickness, this vibration becomes slower until at death, when it fails to hold its form, it disintegrates and returns to its natural elements and gases. Healing is accomplished by reestablishing the normal rate of vibration in all the organs of the body. There are healers on all planes of activity. They use the electromagnetic energy, which belongs to the plane on which they function as healers. Those who use physical magnetism give of their own physical energy and are able to give only a very limited number of treatments any given day. This method requires that they take time to regenerate more power. This power is gathered most easily lying on the ground outside and filling the body with the earth's magnetism or force. Those who use mental magnetism or universal energy on the mental plane send their mental messages to the mind of the patient and by suggestion and encouragement, raises vibration to a state of health. Those who function on the psychic or soul plane project the psychic power into the patient and replaces the imperfect magnetism with a new and more powerful energy. When the psychic body becomes readjusted and filled with power, the physical body reflects health. And those who have awakened with the ability to heal spiritually have learned to become selfless and merely channels for the inflow of spiritual energy from the highest planes that earth can contact. The spiritual energy is the fire which consumes the dross. The dross is that impure matter, and it creates new life, filling the body with light and power. This power or spiritual fire not only heals the body, but also changes the patient's viewpoints and the whole outlook on life, filling him with light. The power expressed through any healer cannot affect those planes of life that are higher than himself. The spiritual power reaches all troubles of the soul in addition to the planes which are of a lower vibration. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The law of opposites is found in all nature and therefore it is found in human life. 
This law demands that everything has two poles of power, positive and negative. For example, light and dark, hot and cold, joy and sorrow. Each pole has a definite work to perform. The negative pole absorbs or takes in power. The positive pole sends out or gives forth the same power. This pair of opposites evolve and unfold, functioning as a complete unit, and all is balanced and good. The wrong use of a good thing can cause it to fail. In the human body, the brain is the instrument upon which man plays. It records and plays our thoughts. The intellect may choose to think positively or negatively. When the brain is negative, it is open and absorbs messages. When it is positive, it creates a new recording. We must remember that positive radiates and negative absorbs. It is up to us to determine what we will allow to be recorded in our minds and what we wish to broadcast from it. Imagine the brain in a negative state waiting for information to be impressed upon it and relaying that information to the body. If we say, I am sick, I'm disgusted, and I'm useless, I'm down and out, then the brain, being in a negative or receiving state, accepts that information that the owner is sick, discouraged, and useless. Then your body acts on this truth, just like you told it. It slows down its vibration and grows weaker and weaker. The stronger the thought, the more power it has to control what happens in your body. Contrast this with a positive thought you provide with your brain. I am well, I am strong, and I am full of hope and joy. The message would be repeated all through the line. The vibration of the body would be quickened and its energy increased. The result is one of an energetic and abundant life. In its untrained state, the mind is unselective. It is impressionable and willingly receives any kind of message, never really paying attention if it is a constructive or destructive thought. The untrained mind will also broadcast any kind of messaging without any thought to what effect it has on others or the world. A trained mind becomes skilled with both the faculties of judgment and of imagination. With these, we are able to apprise all signals coming into us and decide whether or not to accept them. Plenty of messages of fear, doubt, and worry come our way. We can broadcast them to the organs of our body to each cell in each organ. The result is to get ourselves in complete disharmony. This is a choice. We may accept such impressions without wanting to do so, yet it happens when we fail to build up a standard of conviction. This would be a mental model where we can evaluate the incoming messages and decide whether or not to keep them. When we have a good internal set of standards, then it is difficult for adverse messages to seep into our consciousness, even when we are in a negative receptive state. One of the best ways to repel adverse impressions is to keep the mind in a state of sending out constructive thoughts. We cannot take in darkness when we are radiating light. We cannot absorb hate when we are pouring out love. When the mind is acting positively, sending forth constructive thoughts, it is close to all that would negate constructive thought. However, in a positive or sending state, the mind can also choose whether to broadcast good or evil. But modern men and women are likely to make the mistake of projecting a positive state all the time. Doing this, we lose the advantage of having a receiving or negative aspect in our minds. We lose our equilibrium, our balance. On January 25th, 1933, I received what appears to be a message from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and it came through the mediumship of Ida Pittman. A part of this message reads, How I wish I could tell everyone the importance of the negative sheet. The human family has foolishly swung into a positive till. It has lost its equilibrium for bringing things into manifest. He meant that the mind keeps pushing itself to stay in this positive state for such long periods of time that it has now become out of balance. It is forever broadcasting the same old impressions instead of receiving fresh, vital impressions. It's like a broken record, which Harry calls a Victrola vinyl record, which sticks in one place, repeating the same phrase over and over. 
but it is meant to act more like the principle of a two-way radio, receiving and transmitting, taking in new messages in order to give out freely. Yet to take in new information, the mind has to relax into its receiving mode. In its receptive negative state, what shall the mind receive? Does it accept any and all vibrations that come its way? Not at all. The world is full of conflicting vibrations, evil thoughts, as well as good ones. They pound at us all day long. And this was back in 1950. But fortunately, the mind again, like a radio, can tune out as well as it can tune in. It can filter out those messages that are not in harmony with the soul's desires. It can tune out fear, worry, evil report, doubt, hate, mistrust, everything that it does not want to manifest in life. It can tune into nature's own harmonies, the harmony of growing things, tune into the warmth of the sun and the cool rain, even the electromagnetic currents of the earth itself. More, it can tune the very love of God. It can listen and hear the still, small voice, which never fails to make itself heard if it is given the silence in which to speak. In discussing the silence necessary to the mind's receptions, one of my teachers said, it will require much patient training to teach yourself to enter the silence where you can deflect the waves of thought which are surging around you, to calm all the winds of prejudice and doubt that can blow your vessel to crash on the reef. Say to yourself, peace, be still. But when you have mastered your physical being and can sit quietly and let go of the everyday physical world, then you are ready to conquer your mental self. And with this, your will can command peace and silence on every plane of your existence. You will have to still the vibrations and thoughts of your current era, but you will also become so sensitive that the prejudices of past ages the thought vibrations of all those evolving souls who have passed before you on this way will be hammering upon you in this silence. Sit quietly, hold yourself in silence, knowing you are a master and can speak the word that will create a perfect peace around you. When you have accomplished this peace, then you are ready to open the doors onto the higher planes to experience the highest spiritual vibrations, which may be waiting. Then you have access to the vibrations of your brothers and sisters who have learned this before you. Having done this, your life shall be filled with love and feel glorified. Strive, therefore, diligently and earnestly to teach thyself how to enter into the silence and to commune with yourself and God. The blessings of silence begin to manifest themselves almost at once when a period of silence is faithfully kept or so short a time as maybe two or three weeks, the mind begins to gain its lost equilibrium, and we are very well aware of the fact. This negative state is a state of feeling awareness, of inner knowledge, of acquiescence to truth, which is always at hand, but it's not always felt. Then having taken in nourishment, having absorbed some of the higher vibrations, we are ready to utilize the mind's positive aspects. Then to speak the words which send the invigorating vibrations to all parts of the body and to all our outer circumstances. But to speak the positive word requires faith. Look not at the visible things, but at the things which are not seen. The things which you see are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Another quote is, Faith is a substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. In all reports of healing by Jesus, the results hinged on the pivot of faith. In most cases, the sick crying out for healing were showing their faith. In others, Jesus commanded them to perform some act which in itself had no value, except that it was an action of faith. In several cases, someone else stood in on behalf of the patient. Often Jesus said, your faith has saved you, or your faith has made you whole. Just what is faith, and how does it bring on healing? Faith is not primarily an intellectual idea that is worked out by reason or logic. 
The idea of faith, according to logic, is merely a mental theory which sounds well and looks as though it should work, but it is cold and it does not create. Paul said, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Things hoped for are still invisible. In reality, hope is a desire, a thought formed in universal energy and set in motion in the unseen plane as a thing that you want. One may hope for a thing for many years and yet never once really expect to get it. This hope has no substance to build from. It needs expectation. You have to expect an outcome in order to make it manifest. Paul says faith is the evidence of things not seen. Every undertaking requires faith to bring a result. The farmer has faith when he plants his seed. No business can be founded without faith that you can live to see success. Faith is expectancy, assurance, and confidence. These are emotions and must come from the soul, which is the seat of emotion. One must know in his soul. The soul is your higher self, your real or eternal self. When the knower speaks to your body through the brain, the whole body responds with expectancy. The knower broadcasts, I know I am healed. The body vibrates with joy and confidence, and soon it is healed. When we become conscious of the fact that everywhere the universe is flooded with etheric energy, which has been called the breath of God, and we realize that out of this universal substance, all things are created, we have taken a great step. Then if we go further and realize that as God's children, we have inherited this creative ability by which we can shape this universal substance into what we will. Then we are ready to truly live. The Bible says, show me your faith, and I will show you my faith by my works. Even so, faith alone is dead without the works. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. This verifies the statement that an intellectual idea of faith is useless unless it is filled with the emotion of expectancy. Hope with expectancy is bound to work and bring results. Everything built by man, every work of art or music, was first an idea in the mind of its creator, and it was full of the element of expectancy or faith. It follows naturally that when you have faith in something, you work toward the fulfilling of its possibilities. When you believe that your body can be healed or rejuvenated or made more beautiful, your faith impels you to work toward that end. Your thoughts create an image of what you wish to become, and it is repeated over and over to your brain, which in turn repeats it to your body. Every cell of your body starts to build an exact reproduction of the pattern you have given it. And in time, you see what you expected to see. As your body is flooded more and more by the light of spiritual expectancy, you grow more radiant and vibrant. This, in turn, affects your whole atmosphere and your environments, and the circumstances become more harmonious and happy. Sure as sunlight, the greater the faith, the greater the results. This is a deep truth. It seems obvious that a patient can take in more of the healing, whether administered by a doctor of medicine or a doctor of spiritual health, if he expects to be made well, but lack of belief operates in the opposite direction. The deep mind of the healer is involved in the process, and if the patient is shrieking his unbelief, however silently, that unbelief closes contact in the healer's receiving apparatus. The power does not come through nearly as readily. In my own case, I certainly do not consciously share my patient's doubt, but the automatic levels of my mind accept impressions so very readily, just as easily as the phenomenon of hypnosis. This is also the case when an individual with psychic abilities is unable to perform when they are in the presence of a group of antagonistic skeptics. Surround the same individuals with expectant observers, and they go into high gear. Even in the case of so highly developed a personality as Jesus, I think some law was at work behind the fact that he could perform no miracles while he was in Nazareth. Because of the unbelief, 
of his fellow citizens. Probably the same law as was involved in his telling his followers that they could remove mountains if they had enough faith. Now, it is also true that some who have no opinion about spiritual healing are quickly healed. Some of my patients have never heard of spiritual healing until a friend suggested that they come to see me. They come without faith because they come without knowledge. They may have been mildly curious, and maybe they have a great yearning, maybe some of both, but they come with a sort of childlike attitude. I know at once when my hands are on them that here is an open personality. My understanding is that probably in some previous lifetime, they had more spiritual understanding and that their understanding still operates on that much deeper mind, which is not body bound nor conscious. Perhaps the former experience acts as pump priming and faith rises spontaneously in them. Even with the skeptical, help is possible when they have enough curiosity to put their minds on the treatment to the extent of admitting whether or not they feel better or worse afterwards. With their interest aroused, they are awake to the power. And then too, the skeptical ones usually come in order to satisfy someone who loves them and longs for them to be healed. The love of the third party acts on their behalf. But actually, I think many who protest their disbelief are only trying to save face. They don't want the word to get out that they have had any interactions with a faith healer. Ministers in particular seem to have to save face. They explain to me that they want to be open-minded, of course, but, uh, or if they come in faith, they are likely to explain that the word must never reach their parishioners because the parishioners would not understand this sort of thing. They are not ready for spiritual manifestations, they say. Often some of the ministers' leading members are also my patients. But the members are as likely to have told me not to let their minister know of their interests because he would think that they were strange. With ministers and laymen alike, interest in healing through prayer or the laying on of hands is the mark of non-orthodoxy. Except, of course, as the power worked 1900 years ago, across the ocean of that power, it is quite right to speak of that on Sundays. Often, as a patient lies quietly under my hands, the floodgates open, and he tells me his troubles. Most sickness stems from mental and emotional upsets, soul troubles. There is a lack of love, lack of understanding, resentment against the conditions or against other people, mixed upness as to life's meaning or goal. The healing power brings comfort, peace, harmony, which sets the house in order, and love pours in. Healing is a byproduct of love. And after a time, patients recognize the symptoms of non-wholeness, whether these symptoms are mental or physical, and they come in for restoration. Children who are used to coming will cry for me as soon as they are ill or hurt. They are the easiest to heal, although a few adults have the same quality. I explain to them all, young and old, if they ask, that the healing power comes from God the Father. Sometimes it is directed through the offices of high servants of his or from interested personalities who are now living in the larger dimension. And they may come to help someone that they love on earth. 